Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's special program of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Nuria Fernandez, General Manager and CEO of the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority and Chair of the American Public Transportation Association. And I'll serve as moderator for tonight's special program, Honor renowned transportation and environmental advocate, Rod Burdon Sr. The Commonwealth Club has shifted from in-person programs to virtual events, and we're grateful for the support of our viewers. We appreciate your consideration in donating to the club. And if you wish to do so, please text the word donate to 415-329-4231 or visit the club's website at commonwealthclub.org. I also want to remind you to submit questions for our guests via the chat room next to your screen. <clears throat> I'll make every effort to get to as many as time allows in the program. Tonight, I am honored to have a conversation with one of the Commonwealth Club's 2020 Distinguished Citizen Honorees and my friend, Rod Diridon Sr., Emeritus Executive Director of the Mineta Transportation Institute and Chair Emeritus of the California High Speed Rail Authority. Rod is universally regarded as the father of modern transit service, Silicon Valley. In 1976, chaired the first campaign in California for a dedicated sales tax for transit, in perpetuity I might add, helping to create what is now known as the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority. Not stopping there, he went on to chair four successful regional and one statewide transportation funding campaigns, and he organized and chaired the Joint Powers Boards for nine successful rail construction projects. Throughout his career, Rod has chaired over a hundred international, national, state, and local programs, mostly related to transit and the environment. From 1993 to 2016, he served as executive director of the Mineta Transportation Institute, a transportation policy research center created by Congress in 1991, where he retains the title of executive director emeritus. During that time, he was appointed in 2001 and reappointed in 2005 by Governors Davis and Schwarzenegger, respectively, to the California High Speed Rail Authority Board. At 10 years, he was the longest serving board member and is chair emeritus. He is also past chair of the American Public Transportation Association, elected chair of the U.S. High Speed Rail Association's board, and has served for six years as North American vice chair of the International Transit Association in Brussels. Rod's political career began in 1971 as the youngest person ever elected to the Saratoga City Council. He retired in 1995 because of term limits. After 20 years and six terms as chair of both the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors and Transit Board. In that same year, the region's historic train hub was renamed San Jose Diridon Station, which went on to become the catalyst for the next iteration of San Jose's downtown revival. He is also the only person to chair the San Francisco Bay Area's three regional governments, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, the Air Quality Management District, and the Association of Bay Area Governments. Rod is now focused on combating climate change by convening the Rotary Climate Action Council and frequently provides legislative testimony on sustainability. I am so pleased to be able to pay tribute to one of the country's most highly regarded transportation and environmental leaders. Ladies and gentlemen, Rod Diridon Sr. Maria, thank you so much. Uh, you um, had asked me to hold up this award. Yes, please hold up your Distinguished Citizen Award so that we can all see it. It's a big piece of hardware. I'll tell you, it's pretty heavy. Uh, if we see rabbits, we can throw them at them. <laughs> well, you know, I must admit that there's a lot to unpack here in this conversation because just reading your bio, uh, which only covered some of your accomplishments over the many dedicated years of service and your contributions to this industry, I am absolutely convinced that you've got a twin that you haven't told us about. Well, there's definitely a, a clone because there is no way you could have achieved that much in four decades. But I look forward to highlighting all of your accomplishments and uh, want to take uh, this opportunity tonight first to start with 
uh, what drives you? Uh, what's behind this passion that you have carried throughout your career and to this day and your commitment? So please take us through that journey. Well, Nuria, thank you. And I, I guess most people realize we're close friends and I respect you extremely highly. Uh, I believe I'm talking to the next Secretary of Transportation for the <laughs> United States of America. And, and in, at the same time, I, I'd like to thank the Commonwealth Club of California for this wonderful honor. And for all of you who are out there viewing this, uh, this ceremony, uh, good friends and Secretary Norm Manetta and his wife, Denny, are watching today. And uh, so thanks to each one of you for being with us tonight. I'd like to, to stress that uh, uh, I, I was the chair of the American Public Transportation Association, just as Nuria is now, uh, back in 1994 and five. And uh, at that time, uh, the uh, chair became uh, a member of the uh, uh, National Research Council's Transportation Board, and I was chosen to be chair there. And, and then at the end of my chair period, they gave me a, a project to run. And so I invested my $100,000 in a project that was entitled Combating Climate Change, or Global Warming, we said at that time, Combating Global Warming Through Sustainable Transportation Policy. Well, I, I got the study done. It came out saying without equivocation that transportation was causing climate change primarily and that we had it within our, our ability by focusing on mass transportation and alternative transportation devices uh, to, uh, to combat it, but that we had to do it quickly. Uh, well, since that time I have tried and I've only seen the uh, climate change problem becoming worse, rapidly worse. And so as I've retired now, I've, I'm a longtime member of the San Jose Rotary Club, past president. And so I've asked the Rotary Club to create a Rotary Climate Action Committee. And that's expanded out now to be a Rotary Climate Action Council for the region and the northern part of the state. And we hope eventually that'll spread on out uh, to the uh, International Rotary Club of its 32,000 chapters and 1.5 million people around the world. Uh, the Environmental Sustainability Rotary Climate Action Group is our sponsor at the national level, and, and uh, we're, we're moving ahead aggressively there. And in order to give you a context for the questions that are going to occur, uh, let me run through a, a short PowerPoint, which has been given around the world. It's been given in 20 different countries, all 50 states uh, as the presentation at the beginning of conferences most often. The data that you're gonna receive has been double peer reviewed, which means that it's accurate. Uh, and, uh, and it's been done by the finest scientists in the world, if you believe in science, and I do. So uh, let me proceed now uh, through the PowerPoint and then we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll be very pleased to Hear your questions, and I hope that you do use the chat room uh, to send the questions in so that Nuria can present them, and I'll do, I'll do my best to try to answer them. I'm going to go quickly, so please uh, do uh, uh, listen carefully. The first is to remind you that there have been five extinctions in the history of the globe. They go back uh, way four, 444 uh, a million years ago, all the way down to 66 million years ago which was the last extinction. And the scientists are telling us now that we're facing the brink of the sixth extinction. We've gone through five extinctions. They do occur. When that happens, life on earth for that period of time ends. And they, we have to start from scratch again in an evolutionary process. Well, I have grandbabies. I don't want that to happen. And by golly, I'm gonna do all I can and I hope you will join me in doing all you can to make sure that those grandbabies and yours have a future. Next, please. Uh, here's, here's the point. Uh, climate change is happening now. It's human caused. Uh, some of the impacts are already irreversible and the actions we take today are, are gonna decide how the terrific, negative impacts are limited in the future. And we only have 12 years. Next, please. Uh, this, what I'm gonna, going to give you 
is concurred in, the research is concurred in by 99% of the peer-reviewed scientists in the world. This means creditable scientists in the world. 99% and over 11,000 of them have signed a petition asking the world to declare a state of emergency in regard to climate change. Next, please. This is what global warming is. The energy from the sun comes down to the earth, it bounces off, and most of it goes back out into the universe. But some of it is captured under the CO2 blanket. CO2 blanket is like the garage door on your garage. When you're running your car, you want that garage door to be open. Well, our garage door is closed, and that CO2 is thickening all the time and making it more and more closed. And the result is that more and more of the CO of more and more of the energy from the sun is bouncing off the CO2 and coming back to Earth. That's what's causing climate change. Next, please. <clears throat> That's a quote. I'm going to leave it there and, and this saves some time. Let's go on. Next, please. That's this is key. This is on the front page of the New York Times, above the fold, right hand side. And it shows the last 800,000 years in ice corings in the Antarctica. This data was gathered by uh, uh, Russia, the European community, China, and the United States. They agree, they don't agree on anything, but they agree on this. And it shows where the little red arrow is that our CO2 in the atmosphere now is twice as high as ever in the last 800,000 years, and four times as high as the average of the last 800,000 years. Now this is science, this is fact. And it isn't going up and coming down like in the past. That CO2 burden is going straight up. Next. CO2 causes the atmosphere to become hotter. And it's occurred in conjunction with the use of a petroleum powered internal combustion engine. Starting at about mid-century, when we overburdened the atmosphere and becoming out of control now with the last five years being the hottest five years in the 800,000 year history that we can trace on earth. Next. <laughs> so we, we have heat, where's it coming from? This research is from the uh, University of California led uh, uh, the Nobel laureates from all the universities in the state and uh, OSHA or, or uh, the National, uh, National Research Council and, and others. And it shows that 62%, uh, 61% of the, of the uh, pollution is coming from cars, from vehicles on roads, <coughs> all kinds of petroleum powered vehicles and the generation of electricity. So if we can convert the uh, generation of electricity from petroleum and the use of petroleum in, in running our vehicles, we've attacked over 60% of the climate change gases. And that's our task. <coughs> Pardon me. Next, please. And this is the solution. You see this graph done by a, a wonderful professor at the uh, uh, in in uh, uh, in Canada, he was the chair of the National Research Council. By the way, you can have these slides so that you can have the verifications on them. Uh, the worst polluters are cars. Uh, airplanes are right up uh, like next to cars, especially short hop airlines, which are worse than cars in, in many cases. And then there's buses. Buses are not good, but fortunately, we've got Nuria Fernandez for VTA who is converting our buses to electric and hybrid buses. And uh, thank you, Nuria. And then the solution down there where you're looking at uh, high-speed rail, light rail, commuter rail, metro rail, electrically powered. That's what the rest of the world is, is using to meet the Paris Accords. Unfortunately, the last four years, the United States has been falling behind <coughs> and uh, is not doing very well. So we've got to begin pushing very, very hard to uh, convert our transportation systems over to electrically powered. And great, con great congratulations to Governor Newsom for saying that we're gonna have only a car sold new in California by, 1930, uh, by 2035. 
wish you could go faster, but we've got a lot to do before we can get there. Next, please. Okay, so uh, what's happening? As the climate change situation gets worse, we have a disruption in food production. We had epidemics that we haven't expected, uh, water shortages and uh, land turns to deserts. Uh, that's happening all around the midsection of the globe right now, causing mass migrations uh, into the area that has water. And of course that means coming up into the United States and into Europe uh, where we have water for the time being. Uh, we have radical droughts and, uh, 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 and wildfires and flooding. Uh, and it's much more radical than, than usual. And that happens because the ocean gets warmer, is getting warmer. So it, it evaporates more water. The water goes up into clouds. They have more water and there's more pressure behind them. So they move more quickly. They become hurricanes and typhoons. And then they go into, over the uh, land and they dump that water uh, all in one place, and we, they miss other areas completely. So uh, that's, that's what's occurring. Polar ice caps are melting. Of course, that's gonna flood the coastal areas. That means downtown San Jose is gonna be underwater by about 100 feet, unless we can figure out a way to fix this. Uh, next, please. This is the key. This research was done by the United Nations Climate Action Committee. It tells us that we had in 2018, we had 12 years left before the uh, situation may become, could become uh, irreversible. Well, that was two years ago. It means we have 10 years left, it isn't exact, so it may not be more or less. And we can buy more time by taking some actions immediately, but we need to take this seriously. This is the end of the viability of mammals on earth, unless we can turn this back immediately. And, and, and we do that by taking the actions like Governor Newsom took and like we hope new President um, uh, Biden will take as the uh, new leader in Washington. The first action of course is to rejoin the Paris Accords and to be, begin complying with our promises there. Next please. This is what it looks like that 12 year. If we can make the changes in the next four or five years, we'll follow the green line. Well, it's not as comfortable as it used to be. It's gonna be a lot hotter, but it's what we have left. If we don't take, make the changes, we're gonna be following the red line. And that red line is to oblivion. Next, please. Uh, this, uh, this gentleman is an old friend. Uh, he's, uh, working up at Stanford, and he has mapped out the, the way forward for us. Next, please. Uh, and his recommendations are uh, to convert all transportation uh, uh, from petroleum to electric, uh, electrify everything else also, and to uh, do it very rapidly. Next. Uh, the uh, transportation sustainability is measured by high-speed rail, metro and commuter rail, light rail, electric and hybrid buses, electric and hybrid cars, electric and manual bicycles and scooters, and of course, walking. Uh, that's the way forward. And we need to have our average trip each day on those kinds of vehicles. And we're the only country in the world that doesn't have our average trip on sustainable vehicles. Next, uh, buildings, uh, we need solar panels on every flat surface we can find, whether it's commercial home, whether it's commercial or, or uh, a home, uh, uh, vacant lands. Uh, we need to have uh, battery power storage in our home so that we're independent from the grid on those blackout times. Uh, we need to uh, uh, purchase only sustainably generated electricity from our aggregators and we need to have in home insulation, eliminate gas burning fireplaces or burning of any kind. Get off carbon. We need to be only using electricity created sustainably. Next. <clears throat> what you can do? Well, you can join Rotary and, and become a climate change ambassador at our Rotary Climate Action Committees. 
you can uh, join your, you create your own clubs working on this and, and encouraging people to take immediate action to buy a, a electric car. By the way, the electric cars are less expensive now in terms of life cycle costing than the uh, petroleum powered cars because there's no, there's no uh, maintenance to the electric cars and there's reduced uh, uh, fees for uh, registration and uh, licensing and, and insurance. And so it's, it's silly not to buy an electric car that's gonna last you 10 years and have the last five years free. Um, uh, solar panels, and then of course we can pray for the future of our children. Next, please. These are credibility points. You can call these different uh, organizations and ask them about the data. Or if you wanna have a solar panel system uh, installed, uh, call the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, ask them what kind of uh, tax advantages you can have uh, and, and so on and so on. Uh, you're welcome to uh, use that list. If you'd like to have the uh, PowerPoint, just call me and I'll send it to you or you can get it uh, by watching this uh, and, and uh, pausing it there. Next, please. Okay, that's to remind you that uh, this has been prepared by the Rotary Club of San Jose. And uh, we're very pleased to have the Rotary Climate Action Committee and the District 5170 Rotary Climate Action Council uh, working hard, trying to encourage the world to, to focus on uh, on uh, climate action that will allow us to extend that opportunity for our children. You know, in about um, 10, 15, 20 years from now, uh, my children, my little grandchildren are going to be young adults. And if we haven't been successful, they're gonna come to, to us as they're fighting for their lives. And they're gonna look us in the eye and they're gonna say, Papa, when you had the opportunity, did you do all you could possibly do to fight climate change so we'd have a future? Well, I'm gonna look back at them with tears in my eyes and tell them, yes, I tried as hard as I could. What will you say? That is quite something, uh, Rod. Thank you so much for sharing that presentation with us. I. Um, <sighs> I have learned so much uh, from what you just described and uh, you've put together a rich body of work that is gonna leave a legacy like none other. So thank you for that. So now let's turn to our conversation. Uh, you know, it's often said that uh, to better understand how we got here, we need to explore a bit of the past. So just going back to understand how you got here. Uh, you are the son of an immigrant Italian railroad brakeman. Railroading therefore is in your DNA but you chose a political path. So at what specific moment did you know that transportation would become your life's work? Uh, Nuria and my dad uh, working on the railroad didn't uh, set a good example before because that was a hard job, but he was away a lot. But when I got uh, old enough to think about college, we didn't have enough money to pay for food next week. So uh, the, I had a choice of uh, either becoming a railroader or going to college. So I, I went to work on uh, summers and uh, weekends and so on as a brakeman on the railroad, pushed the big freight trains up and down the tracks from the caboose or running up and down and storing switch and doing things. And I did that for seven summers and vacations to get through college. So I got an understanding of how mass transportation worked, but I wasn't enthused about being involved with it. And uh, after coming back from Vietnam, I, I, I got involved in politics and got elected to the County Board of Supervisors. And I was the youngest member and they had just started a transit agency, which was doing terribly. And so the old guys on the board voted to assign me the transportation responsibility. <clears throat> well, I was too young and dumb not to, not to realize that it was not a good thing. And so I happily grabbed it and lo and behold, after a period of time, it became to be, to me, to be an outstanding opportunity. And, and, and that's how I became involved. And, and the Valley really has needed that transportation. And they've been very willing to pay for it, out and pay for it. So it's, it was a good marriage. 
It, it certainly was or is, and we have been the beneficiaries of your involvement. I'm so glad you said yes when asked to step in. So, uh, so with the outcome of the 2020 uh, general election top of mind, let us shift our conversation to sustainable funding uh, for transportation. Your work in this area dates back to 1976. Uh, it's quite remarkable. Uh, Santa Clara County has greatly benefited from forward-thinking voters who are willing to tax themselves for transportation improvements. You don't find that in other parts of this country. So please explain to those out there who do not live and breathe transportation funding like you and I do and others, what is so critical to have support from all levels of government, the local, the state, the federal, so that we can deliver and maintain sustainable transportation solutions? Well, we have to realize that the reason why government does transportation is because it is not profitable. The only transportation system in the world that makes money is high-speed rail. And, and that is usually done on a franchise with the government building the system and then franchising that out to a private operator that then can operate at a profit. But all of the other transportation systems require a subsidy to be built and operated. And that's the facts of life. It isn't just here in America, it's all around the world. And, and so uh, you have to have a blend of the funding from the various levels in order to make it work. Well, we've contributed more than our share from the local voters here in Santa Clara County because of our approval time and time again of half cent sales taxes for construction and for operation. And uh, thanks, thank goodness to the Silicon Valley Leadership Group and and their, their past uh, CEO, Carl Guardino, for chairing so many of those tax elections for us. And, and um, so the Santa Clara County portion is way oversubscribed. The state portion has been pretty consistent. They've had some funding for transit, primarily for highways, but some for transit. And, but the real money that we are missing now is coming from the federal government. It used to be back in the 70s and 80s, that the federal government would, would pay 80%, sometimes 90% of a transit project. Now they may not give you anything, but certainly no more than 50%. And oftentimes it's more like 20%. I think the BART project that's coming into downtown San Jose now is getting about uh, 30%, is that right? 25. 25%. You know, expedited project delivery pilot program. Isn't that a, a travesty? When, when the federal government is supposed to be funding those capital projects. And we've had to come up with most of that money from the state and local. And so we're having to, to, uh, to uh, compensate for lack of enthusiasm for mass transportation coming out of the federal government. And we have to, uh, I, I hope sincerely that uh, new president Biden is going to be able to remedy that. He's a train rider himself. He's enthused about mass transportation. And he is, he is, he is campaigned on the idea of combating climate change and uh, creating a, a better uh, sustainable transportation system. Uh, there's a discussion now of a, of a uh, omnibus uh, infrastructure bill that could be as much as $2 trillion. And if, if that can come forward, as a, not only a transportation bill, but primarily as a jobs bill, and then it could be our breath of fresh air for creating the transit systems in Santa Clara County that we so badly need. Yeah, so how optimistic are you that there's gonna be cooperation in Washington to make that happen? Well, I, I'll be a lot more optimistic if we can pick up two votes in, in Georgia, <laughs> but uh, the uh, I think there's some enthusiasm coming out of the the Senate, which is our sticking point uh, for, for uh, uh, an infrastructure, a jobs infrastructure bill. And uh, with a big, strong push out of the White House and support from Congress, it may be that we can get that jobs bill anyway. And that would be the, the break that we are so desperately needing. Yes, and we need that break. And, and we know that, that infrastructure investment helps everyone. Uh, so it, it's a long supply chain of those who benefit from it. And then the outcome, of course, is better transportation. Mm -hmm. So let's now- uh, I, I, I might add. Yeah. I voted. You did. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> and so did uh, 75 million other people. <laughs> so we're, we're happy. Yeah. Um, so 
2020 has been challenging in many ways. Uh, as you can only imagine, you've lived through it with all the rest of us, uh, the health, the economy, social equity, and politics. Uh, and the pandemic has really flipped transit on its head. And because you have been so close to transit throughout your career, can you share some thoughts on how we can strengthen the public's trust in transit uh, so that we can regain not only the riders that we have, but to attract some new riders? And that, of course, feeds right into your climate change initiative, which is to mitigate traffic and improve air quality. Absolutely. I think that we did the first thing by, by uh, electing a, an environmentally oriented president. And if we continue to sponsor those kinds of political leaders, they can give us the guidance that is necessary uh, in terms of setting uh, the, uh, the leadership image, which is so terribly important in a democracy. And, and uh, then once you have that image and that direction, uh, we need to make sure that we create a fine mass transportation system. Uh, one of the things that we have we've suffered from here in Santa Clara County is that we haven't completed our system. We have, we, had a light rail system that was designed around the, the, the best examples in the world. And we've only built about 40% of it. So people don't use half a system. They can use half of a highway and, and get off the freeway and use local streets with their car. And, but they can't take go halfway on a mass transportation system to where they're going to go because there's nothing to get onto to go the rest of the way. So they just don't use it. So we've got to finish our system here in Santa Clara County and that's, uh, of course, going to require an emphasis on, on mass transportation and, and fiscal support from the federal level. But we, we really do uh, need to set the example. And then let me tell you what's ultimately going to do it. As people come back to work, they're going to flood back out onto those freeways. And it's going to cause the congestion that we had before, only even more, because we're going to be hiring more people. And, and uh, those... Highways are going to become overcrowded. They're going to become pollution uh, generators again. And uh, before you know it, we're going to be forced into the mass transportation system because there isn't going to be an alternative. And at that point, we need to be ready. Yes, and that's for sure. And uh, the transit agencies are doing all we can and pedaling as fast as we can to make sure that that happens. Well, you can't, uh, pedal, well, any, you can't pedal any faster than you have the money, so... <laughs> That's where I was going next. <laughs> All of that is going to need money, uh, funding, so that we can not only provide what we are providing today, but also be ready for uh, expansion and the added capacity that's going to be necessary. Uh, so just to lighten things up a bit, after talking about what we do not have, uh, could you share with us what you believe were some bright spots uh, this year? Uh, I know that there are a number of silver linings in there somewhere. Well, the biggest silver lining occurred last Tuesday. And um, that re really gives us hope for the future. Otherwise, we would have been down the creek. Uh, but uh, that, that's the biggest uh, step in the right direction. The other interesting point for a person who loves his wife and, and, uh, and, and the children that are all around me here uh, is a chance to stay home and, and hug people. Uh, it, it, that, that opportunity of, of retrenching and, and, and being uh, with the people that you love day in and day out. Uh, that's that's a wonderful thing. And I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't have a, a significant portion of the work at home people staying working at home. I know that uh, some of the major industries uh, in our valley have indicated an intention to retain their telecommuting programs. And so that might be a, a, a glimmer of hope. That and I hope uh, people are going to become, begin to recognize that climate change is real especially with the Biden's leadership, it is real and we've got to respond quickly. So maybe the last glimmer of hope is, is that we've really got an opportunity now to, to uh, meet that 10 year deadline and protect the future for our kids. Very good point. You know, in talking about glimmer and bright spots, I would like to recognize the Mineta Transportation Institute for its impressive library of research. And the great work is done in churning out grad students in the field of transportation management. I have um, 20 employees at the Valley Transportation Authority that have graduated from MTI's MTN program. And uh, th that number is going to continue to grow. You were there, Rod, at the beginning. So tell us about the, this MTI program and what it means that you help build 
such a wonderful pipeline of transportation leaders. Nuri, it was uh, it was a true pleasure to be involved with that, and it, it was a melding of, of two loves. I I have been a college professor at night, uh, pro bono, teaching in the Graduate School of Business at San Jose State uh, while I was on the Board of Supervisors for the all twenty years, and so the opportunity then to shift over and become an administrator of a research institute uh, just was a natural, and uh, it, it it was uh, enjoyable. And it was especially enjoyable to be able to work with people like you. You're a past chair of the Manetta Institute's Board of Trustees. And, uh, and, and you and others that were on that Board of Trustees were the ones that really helped make it happen. You created the, the international leverage that uh, allowed the Manetta Institute to have much more impact uh, than uh, would normally be the case. And of course, the ace, the ace of spades in this process is Secretary Norm Manetta. Who's, who the foresight uh, in creating the Institute and uh, whose leverage all along the way allowed us to be uh, remarkably successful. And uh, the current director, uh, Dr. Karen Philbrick is doing a wonderful job now uh, in, with carrying the program on and reaching even higher uh, standards of excellence. Yeah, well, you know, it's always good to talk about the past the present, and now I'd like to pivot and talk a little bit about the future uh, of transportation. You know, technology, we're here in Silicon Valley, and there are advancements in transportation that are happening frequently uh, to help improve the way we travel. So what advice would you offer transit agencies on working with the private sector to make mobility better for its users? Well, I, I guess I don't want to be a stick in the mud here. <clears throat> But I'd, li I'd like us to be cautious about jumping into new transportation technologies that are not proven. Things like uh, Tesla's uh, power tube and vacuum tube system and other kinds of things like that. Uh, those systems are going to be 20, 30 years before they are, they are broadly implementable because the federal and state government are not going to allow you to spend their grant money on projects that are not for sure going to be successful. So let's recognize that we've got a commitments to modes here, modes that have been proven to be outstandingly successful in meeting the climate change and mobility uh, needs of the world. High-speed rail mo operating at 235 miles an hour in China is a proven technology. And because it's a proven technology, the construction techniques are, are becoming more standard and uh, let's build it. Uh, we're the only one in the world that doesn't have a high-speed rail system. We're the only country, only advanced country in the world. And let's build it. Let's not sit back and say, oh, maybe something better is gonna come along. Something better isn't gonna come along in the time period necessary for us to survive this, this climate change challenge. And same thing with other modes of transportation. Uh, the electric vehicles, you know, it, it was a stretch in 1996, when I had my little red electric, a uh, little red uh, Porsche uh, converted into an electric car, 22 golf cart batteries were in that poor little red Porsche. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it, would, it would go 100 miles an hour, but it took a while to get there. And uh, I've been driving electric cars now since 1996. And I've watched the evolution of those cars. Uh, from the Porsche to the EV1 from General Motors, which was way ahead of its time. It should have, it should have been the leading the world right now, but it got discontinued. Uh, then uh, the, uh, the uh, Leaf, and now uh, more recently, uh, the Model S uh, uh, Tesla, and uh, my little Model 3. My wife has just purchased a Model Y Tesla. And the reason we're not rich people, I'm an old politician retired on a on a politician's uh, income, and but it's it's a dumb thing not to buy an electric car, because in the life of that electric car, a ten year life of the electric car, it will doubly pay for itself in the savings that you're going to have in terms of reduced energy costs, no maintenance costs, and reduced fees. So uh, it's a no brainer. It's a matter, as you indicated earlier, Nuria, that the public has to catch up with the uh, 
with the opportunity. Yeah, I want to bring the conversation back to high speed rail because so many of us talk um, about our experience with high speed rail in Europe and Asia and kind of look to those countries uh, with envy. And yet uh, we're having a hard time just getting high speed rail, the support for high speed rail and the funding that it needs here in California and then, of course, in the U.S. So what any hope for uh the U.S. in the high-speed rail space in the foreseeable future? You see a lot of those plans that have been proposed a decade ago starting to roll out? Yes, uh, there is absolute hope. The uh, U.S. High-Speed Rail Association is working hard on it, as are various other groups. Uh, 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 new President uh, Biden is absolutely enthused about it. He's an Amtrak writer. And uh, what we lack is funding. And of course, the petroleum industry is combating the, the issue all of every chance they get. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I think the, we turned the corner there. So it's a matter now of coming up with the funding and that infrastructure bill, that omnibus inf infrastructure bill, uh, that will be a jobs bill and a construction bill of maybe as much as $2 trillion uh, could be the key. And, and the funding there could come from uh, uh, carbon disincentive fees uh, could come from the uh, uh, infrastructure bank, which is being considered now uh, by uh, Seth Moulton uh, back mm -hmm. in Congress. And uh, uh, several other opportunities now are popping up. And, and if those funds could be created at the national level, only a very small uh, fee on the carbon uh, that we import from other countries uh, and and uh, and and extract from the ground uh, could fund uh, uh, the complete construction of the high speed rail program in the United States. Yeah, you know, one of the resistance about high speed rail is that people see it as just an urban solution, um, and uh, trying to figure out what the relevance is to smaller towns. Uh, we have more rural areas in the state than we have urban centers, so the question is. What needs to happen to start to demonstrate that's the, the significance, the relevance, the, the benefit uh, of high-speed rail to get the elected members of Congress who have the power of the pen to support and fund it? I think, first of all, we need to remind them what's happening around the world. Mm. All around the world, every other industrial country and most emerging countries, 14 of them now, have high-speed rail systems in operation, and another 10 are in the process of, of uh, planning and building high-speed rail. The high-speed rail is, uh, is defined as a rail system going over 300 kilometers per hour, 187 miles an hour. And at that speed, and by the way, ours in California is gonna go 220 miles an hour. At that speed, uh, it's faster between cities as much as six or 700 miles apart to go by train than by air. It's faster downtown to downtown. And, and the downtowns is where the distribution systems are, the feeder and distribution systems are. And, and so we need to have people see what's happening around the world. And maybe we, our media folks can help us there. And then the second thing is to, is to um, concentrate as you are here at VTA with developing a feeder and distribution system, which is sustainable. Your, your uh, system focusing on the downtown San Jose and other industrial and commercial modes, nodes around the, uh, the valley uh, based on uh, BART and commuter rail and uh, light rail and your fine uh, electric and, and uh, sustainable bus fleet, uh, that system is wonderful. It needs to be completed. We need to get the money to build, build it out. But that system, especially when you build uh, transit villages for those stations and on top of those, uh, those parking lots, that system will, will accommodate several hundred thousand more people in the valley, which we have to do. Silicon Valley is growing rapidly and we don't want to have those people commuting long distances. So that system will be a, the model system for the United States, if we can complete it. And that's just a matter of money. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's all about the funding, right? Um, 
we uh, let's see. I think I'm. We're at the point now where we're going to be taking questions uh, that we're gathering from the audience. I've tried to weave some of those questions in uh, throughout. But before we do that, however, we're going to play two short video testimonials from a few friends of yours who wish to congratulate you on this prestigious honor. Hi, Rodrigo. Hi, congratulations on your receiving this Distinguished Citizens Award from the Commonwealth Club. Quite an honor, man. We've known each other since our college days at San Jose State. And uh, of course, you were always the studious one, you know, always involved in student government while I was out having fun, enjoying the hell signing days of my youth. Well, you've always been my most loyal and faithful friend and supporter, always including me in your great many of your activities. Can't keep up with you. You were president of our Rotary Club in 2009 and 2010. It took me a lot longer, but I followed you 11 years later as president. But I was wise enough to ask you to be my mentor. Thank you for being that. We've been together as board members with Bob Keeves radio station, participating in monthly quest meetings uh, to discuss events of the day. And I was pleased to drive you several times to Palo Alto for your medical treatments while you regaled me with your memories of your hometown of Dunsmuir. You even took me and Cecily to actually visit and tour the town. <laughs> You're very proud of it. Rightly so. You have the energy of a man half your age. Well, all right, three quarters your age. <laughs> <laughs> I keep begging you to slow down so your body can rest, but you are a driven man. This Distinguished Citizens Award is your latest but I know it will not be the last. Congratulations, amigo, my dear friend and mentor. Thank you. Thank you, compadre. You, uh, uh, Hi, Rod. It's not often that one person has served their community as effectively as you and for such a good length of time. Congratulations on this Distinguished Citizen Award. Rod. It takes one cutie pie to know another cutie pie, but I must say you are a most distinguished cutie pie and so deserving of this award and your recognition. So congratulations to a very special sweetie pie. And keep on railroading. Uh, what special people, the, the Epsteins, Judy and Joy Epstein. Yes, and, and um, President Fernando Sasueta from the Rotary Club. I thought that was awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, there are so many admirers and fans, Arad. Uh, but I think that's what we could fit in. Um, since uh, Fernando mentioned uh, mentors, I'd uh, like to know who, who your mentors are. Well, originally, uh, my, uh, my original mentor was the minister at my church. I'm an old Episcopalian from a little town in Northern California. And the minister was the uh, coach on the little league team and the Boy Scout troop uh, uh, leader and, and so on. And I really wanted to be like him when I grew up, even thought about being a minister at one time. And then, uh, of course, your, your parents are always your, your, your uh, models. But when I got back uh, from Vietnam, I got involved in the Junior Chamber of Commerce and, and uh, Senator Al Alquist uh, grabbed me by the scruff of my neck and said, hey kid, I want you to come over here and, and uh, do some consulting work for me. And I had just started a research company and I sure needed the business. And, and then I began to realize how absolutely special person Al Alquist was. He was the original Senator Alquist who served for 32 years in the legislature, and uh, he, he set the course for me in politics. And I, I think that's uh, probably the primary, uh, primary person that I wanted to emulate. Yeah. And you know, I'm sitting here uh, watching your backdrop um, of the Deridon station. Tell me what it feels to have a station named after you. And and when you walk into, when you step into it, you know, what, what is that experience? What is that like? Well, Nuria, for a long time, you know, it's been oh, 30 years now since it was named. Uh, and 
uh, a long time, I, I, I got the willies when someone would say Deridon Station. And I didn't under, it, it didn't compute very well. And now it's just really wonderful. I'm, I'm happy to see it there. I'm happy to be an advocate for, for treating the old business building like an historic landmark like it is. It's, and it needs to have some repairs and, and so on. I, I chaired the reconstruction project for, the, for it back in the early 90s, late 80s and early 90s. And uh, it was rebuilt beautifully. But time sure passes. And, and it's, it really does need some help again. Yes, yeah. uh, so uh, beautiful structure. It's just absolutely stunning. It's a classic, uh, classic building. It was the biggest train station on the West Coast until uh, Union Station in LA was built, and and uh, uh, Union Station was was built modeled after this station uh, in great part. Although Union Station is about ten times as big. Yes, uh, it, it, it's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Not a problem. Um, you know that uh, you mentioned um, earlier about when we were talking about high speed rail, how important it is for the media to expand on that issue so that uh, we can educate more people here in the U.S. Uh, through that experience. So just thinking about the media, what would you want to ask them to say about transportation? Because they have such a broad channel and can reach so many more people than we are today. Well, I know, as with you, uh, you you write articles for the paper, and and I've been writing op eds for uh, for various papers. I was pleased to have one in the Times a little while back, and and uh, and frequently have them in the local papers, the Chronicle and Mercury News, and and the Business Journal and and Spotlight. And uh, I I try to to stress first of all. The, the terrific need, both in terms of fighting climate change as well as creating sustainable mobility for our industry, uh, that, that the crying need that we move ahead now uh, while we do have a little bit of time. And uh, that is, is uh, responded to very well by the Chronicle, sometimes well by the Mercury and News, usually, and, and the Times, you, New York Times, of course, is, is a great crusader. Business Journal and the Spotlight are, are very much in favor of mass transportation. So we're doing pretty well in our valley. And it's just a matter of having them talk about it enough. And if, if we, the readers, ask for that kind of information, then the media will cover it. Uh, they're selling a product and we're the buyers. So we need to let them know what we want. And I think they'll cover it more. Well, well said. Uh, members of the audience want, want to know um, what uh, you're most excited to see happen over the next 10 years. And then uh, the next question is, uh, do, you, do you see in that future, uh, 30 years from now, that the cars will still be around? Well, I think cars will be around forever and ever. Uh, but they... Uh, they might be self-driving and they certainly will be electrically powered. Uh, although, you know, I bought a little Tesla because I like to drive. Uh, it's electric, but I like to drive. So I think, I think we're going to see cars on roads forever. And it's just a matter of the kinds of cars that are on the roads. We may see car trains uh, of, uh, of a half a dozen cars trained together going from point A to point B together in commute hours and uh, kind of coming together automatically. But those, those things I think are gonna be here forever. More and more, we're gonna to have to have people on mass transportation because we can't expand our roadway capacity much. We're out to the sound walls all up and down and, and the uh, access roads off of our freeways into our employment centers can't handle much more pressure. Uh, so we, we're gonna, see those roadways at full capacity forever and ever. And it's a matter now of creating the mass transportation systems that will carry the increased capacity requirements for the long-term future. If we don't do that, then Silicon Valley will have no choice but to explode and, and headquarters companies moving all over the world and leaving, uh, leaving us looking like Detroit. No, we can't have that. Uh, so, uh, uh, 
aside from climate change, what other goals would you like to accomplish? I know there's a number of things that you've started. Uh, just give us an insight into that. Well, I think climate change is by far the number one uh, objective. It's it's the life and death uh, uh, existential issue of our period of history. And I mean, not of just uh, American history, I mean of human history. And if we don't uh, get ahead of it, we don't um, turn that corner, then no other objectives are going to make any uh, difference at all. So every energy, every fiber, Fernando chides me for working too hard. Well, every fiber of my being is going to be focused on uh, expanding the Rotary Climate Action uh, Program uh, in San Jose and in the region and in the nation to uh, working with, I should stress, that the Environmental Sustainability Rotary Action Group is the umbrella organization for that. Uh, in uh, Yavuzatilla, uh, down in Monterey, is the Western, uh, Great Western uh, Chair for that. Uh, and he's doing a great job and we, we're doing all we can to support him and to expand the program as much as we can. And that, that's where my focus is gonna be. And uh, I'm gonna recruit every bright young mind I can into that, that objective and, and where I can run them for city councils and, and uh, you know, that, that did absolutely happen. We started the Rotary Climate Action Program uh, uh, in 2019, several young people, nine young people joined San Jose Rotary Club in order to be involved in the Rotary Climate Action Program, two of them ran successfully for city council this last time. Uh, 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 David Cohen and Don, uh, uh, or uh, Matt Mahan. And uh, they're, they're, they came out of our Rotary Climate Action Program. And that's what we need to do now in order to uh, uh, take over the future so that there is a future for our kids. Yeah. Well, you know, talk about mentors and speaking about Monterey, uh, here's a nice shout out from an audience member, uh, Christina Watson at TAMSI, uh, MTI grad in 2007. She says, congratulations, Rod. You were my mentor at MTI and I really appreciate your expertise and all the work that you do. So here you have it. I, re I remember Christina. Uh, she was an outstanding student and she was especially good at communication, very a uh, very uh, dynamic redheaded lady. And she, uh, she was able to make uh, her, her presentations in my Master of Science and Transportation Management classes, uh, very interesting. She was very, vi very vivacious and dynamic. And now she's down there running TAMSI and, and we, we got to get that train system from Monterey up to Gilroy soon. So, so thinking about Christina, so how important is it that that you believe for young people, especially women, to get engaged in politics. Um, we are working feverishly to get more women in the pipeline in transportation, but we know that a lot of the decisions and funding policies and other things are in the political realm. So why do you have to say about that? Just in a few, just a few thoughts on that. On that well, topic. as a father of both a son and daughter, uh, let me be sure that I say this the way I want to. You guys are used to having it easy. You, you're competing with half of the population in trying to pursue success. Well, now you have to compete with the whole population in order to pursue success. And that's not a bad thing. So just um, knuckle up and, and get in there and, and fight hard for your opportunities in the future. And ladies, the way is open for you. It's been broken down by uh, many crusaders that knew, we know the names uh, uh, all the way clear back to Susan B. Anthony and, and, uh, and, and the, the, the recent people here in our valley, especially people like Janet Gray Hayes and Susan Hammer, uh, Pat Dando, uh, they're, they've mapped the course for you. And now, you don't have an excuse. You got to get out there and compete head on with these guys. That means you have to do the job that was being done better than they could have done it. And, uh, and so 
uh, the, the playing field isn't quite perfectly double yet. There's still a bit of a glass ceiling, but it has so many cracks in it that you're going to be able to get through it pretty easily now compared to the past. And it's a matter of you getting out there and fighting and uh, using your, your wonderful talents and becoming equal, uh, equal crusaders in this uh, fight for the future. Well, the vision for equality is certainly going, um, it's something that we'll continue to push for. So now we are um, at that place uh, in our program when there's one last question. So I am going to exercise the privilege of the moderator and ask it. Uh, with over four decades of hindsight in your, uh, to your advantage, what would you have done differently, if anything, to change the course of history? The mood of our citizenship now is just so low. Um, you know, what, what do you think um, can help with that, uh, just looking back as we look forward? I am so happy with where I am in life right now that I can't think of going back and changing any of the building blocks it would have led me to where I am. I think those building blocks, I didn't do them all right. I sure screwed up some of them, but that led me to where I am now. And it's as though I was guided to this point in time so that I could be useful. And so I'm not gonna change anything. I'm just gonna try as hard as I can to use what I have now and what's left to save the world for my kids. Love your optimism. Rod, thank you so very much and congratulations again. Uh, we also want to thank our viewing audience. Um, you have been terrific and I know that you are well deserving of this honor that you have received today from the Commonwealth Club. I want to remind the audience uh, that on November 30th, the club will salute another Distinguished Citizen Award recipient, Lauren Dox, at the S.D. Bechtel Jr. Foundation. Uh, in 2021, we will honor Dr. Matthew State, John Pritzker, and the UCSF system. I am Nuria Fernandez, and thank you, and please stay safe, be well, and good night. Thank you, Nuria. <laughs>